The United Kingdom is trying to ensure millions of people don't get left out when it comes to COVID vaccinations. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab is urging the UN Security Council to support a resolution calling for vaccination ceasefires in war zones. He says over 160 million people are at risk of being excluded from vaccinations because of instability and conflict. How, though, would this ceasefire actually work and can it work? You, the UK's High Commissioner to Canada, Susan Lejeune Daldrashek, joins us now from Ottawa. Hello, High Commissioner. Good to see you as always. Nice to see you too, Vashi. From the UK's perspective, why is this ceasefire necessary? Well, I think it's very clear that um, the pandemic uh, affects the whole of the globe. And until everybody is safe, uh, nobody is safe. We can't just, as, 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 uh, as I heard just before the break, uh, just uh, vaccinate our own populations in developed Western countries. And I think we all have a moral responsibility to make sure the vaccines are, are distributed equitably around the world. And the most vulnerable populations are those in conflict zones. And we are very clear that uh, ceasefires for to allow medical personnel to address the medical needs and the vaccination needs of, of people in those conflict zones absolutely crucial in order to make sure that they get vaccinated and that they're protected like the rest of us. Are there particular areas or conflict zones uh, of concern? Like, are, are, is there, are there a few that you would highlight? Well, I think, um, you know, places like Yemen, where the situation is already extremely difficult, South Sudan, but, you know, there, there are a number of countries around the world where, uh, where conditions are precarious. And uh, I think it's really important that we work together to make sure that people living in those conditions uh, are vaccinated and protected like the rest of us. How, uh, how confident are you that something like this will actually work? I, I put to you, for example, uh, in March, the UN Secretary General launched a call for a global ceasefire to assist the containment efforts for COVID-19. It took the Security Council three months to agree to a resolution supporting that call. Uh, and, and while certainly, you know, it's been of some help, there, it's not like there's been a global pause in fighting. So how realistic do you think this is? No, I, I think you're right, Vashi. It's difficult. Um, you know, it always takes time. Uh, negotiations at the UN are sometimes long and drawn out. But there are uh, precedents of this having worked. In Afghanistan, for example, uh, there were uh, ceasefires to allow the continuation of the polio vaccination efforts there um, when, when the conflict was, was at its height. So I think there are precedents that we can draw on. Um, and there are um, some really capable international organizations who have experience of doing this, uh, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent in particular, but other parts of the UN system too. So we're confident that it can work. And we are working really, really hard in New York um, as the chair of the Security Council to make sure that we get the votes necessary to get this resolution through. Do you think that the vaccinations might be, and I don't mean this in a crass way, but might be an easier sell than, for example, just more broadly containment efforts? Like vaccinations are a pretty concrete example of how this could end. I think you're right. And I think it's it's, it's very difficult to be against vaccinating the population. So it is a concrete small step, but it's a very important one. And it's something which um, is, is quite actually quite complex to deliver because you need not only your doctors and nurses to, to administer the vaccine, vaccines, but as you know, you need the proper storage facilities and so on. So it's a complex operation, but it's one, I think, where there are, there are, some, there are some very good uh, past experience to draw on. Um, and I think it, you know, it doesn't actually give benefit to either side in a conflict. You know, it, it, it's not something that that one side can say, oh, you know, by doing this, you're making it easier for the other side to win. So I think it's, I think you're right. It's a, it's a pretty easy win for everybody. This endeavor, and, and the foreign minister spoke to this, speaks more largely to the idea, and we heard the secretary general in that clip you mentioned as well that played into the commercial, talk about more equitable access to vaccines. One of the mechanisms for that is the COVAX program. Uh, just for our viewers, this is where a number of countries buy in. They secure a certain number of uh, doses for themselves, but also for less developed countries. The UK, I think, and correct me if I think you're the top donor to the program uh, at this point, it, but the program still needs more money is also my understanding. It, are there plans in the UK to, uh, to spend more money on that program? Well, we've already given a half a billion pounds. So as you say, we're the biggest donor. Um, we are encouraging other people to do so. But I think with the funds that COVAX has already, there will be 1.3 billion doses of vaccine uh, available to develop already quite a significant effort but we all continue that through our presidency of the G7 encouraging others to to contribute because it is a very very important vehicle for delivering uh, vaccines to countries which otherwise would have 
great difficulty at vaccinating their populations. Canada is also a, a part of the program, and I'm sure you're familiar with the discussion that ensued a few weeks ago in which uh, in that first round of distribution, Canada has decided to access doses that, yes, it, it bought, but it's the only G7 country in that round to access it. Does the Did the UK on purpose skip the round, or are there plans to access their doses at a later time? Like, what can you tell us about that? I don't think there are any plans for us to access the doses, but we are in a we are in a slightly different position from Canada. And I think you know countries that contribute, it is it's it's you contribute to access your own doses, but the quid pro quo is that you uh, equally allow others to uh, to access it who are less fortunate than yourself, less developed than yourself. So when you say though that you're, there are no plans, it's obviously the UK is vaccinating at a very quick rate compared to a lot of countries. It's it's the plan is going fairly well. I think you can say at this point though it's had its hurdles as well. So does that mean that you you might not ever access the doses? I don't think at the moment there is no need for us to do it. We've already vaccinated 15 and a half million people, which is something like 23% of the population. So at the moment we're able to access the doses that we need without having to draw on the COVAX facility. I mean, it is, you're, you're right. It's a, it, Again, it's an incredibly complex process, but I think it's been it's been very successful in the UK. Um, and, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a model of how it can be done. Um, uh, 15 and a half million people in a fairly short space of time is a really impressive achievement. So is, am I accurate to say that the UK's position is as long as they can secure their supply elsewhere, they won't access those doses and those doses could end up could go to less developed countries then? I think that's that's the situation at the moment. Yeah. OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. Good to see you as always. Thank you. That's the UK's High Commissioner to Canada, Susan Lejeune Daldrashek. <music> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.